lesson. You may have heard these words before, but I'll teach you what they really mean. Go beyond! Plus! Hey, what's up my fellow Beyonders? Sir James here coming at you with another video from Go Beyond Comics. Today, my friends, I'm going to be covering the ongoing Transformers Beast Wars series. Shout out to King of the Beast Wars who recommended I cover this series. I was honestly unsure if I should cover it, but he told me it was worth it. So again, shout out to King of the Beast Wars. Now, the creative team behind this series is writer and cartoonist Eric Burnham who previously wrote the miniseries Transformers and Ghostbusters, which honestly is a crossover I never even thought of, but sounds like fun. The artist is Josh Burkham, who is known for the series Last Stand of the Wreckers and More Than Meets the Eye. I know a couple of you guys have told me I should cover Last Stand of the Wreckers, which I definitely will do at some point because that story sounds amazing. So usually when I cover a comic series, I do one issue at a time, but with this series, I thought, let's do something different. Let's cover multiple issues. Even though it was going to take me longer, I said, let's just do it. So the plan was just to cover the first three issues of this series. And it quickly went from me just covering the first three issues to me covering the entire Savage Landing arc. So this will be the longest video I've ever done. But before we get started, please hit that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. We are so close to a thousand subscribers. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. It would be awesome if we can get there. Now, with all that out of the way, let's not waste any more time and get right into this story. So, part one of Savage Landing opens on Cybertron with the Tripredicus Council, whose members are Sea Clamp, Ramhorn, and Cicadacon, who are all Predacons. Now, if you're not aware who these bots are, they're the ruling body of the Predacons on Cybertron. We see them receiving a transmission from the Predacon Galavar, who explains his plan to steal a rumored golden disc that contains valuable information from the Maximal Science Ministry. As Galavar is telling them his plan, he is already enacting. He has his soldiers, Scorponok, Dinobot, and Pterosaur, break into the Ministry's main hall and take out the Maximal Security Guards. And can I just say, dude, I love seeing Dinobot here. He was one of my favorite characters back on the Beast Wars show. He gets into a confrontation here with Pterosaur because he goes to kill the security guard that's begging for his life, but Dinobot feels that there's no honor in killing a defenseless foe. To just stun the security guard already and be done with it. Scorponok ends it just by killing the guard himself. At the same time, another group of Predacons break into the great shipyard in Voss and destroy almost every transwarp capable Starcraft before stealing the Maximal Warship dark side so really galvar's goal here is to buy himself enough time to flee into deep space travel through time and decode whatever secrets that the golden disc may possess before the maximals can mount a coordinated response the tripredicus council thinks galvar's plan is a bold one but believe it's doomed to fail and tell him that they don't permit him to enact it however galvar tells the council they misunderstand. He wasn't asking for permission. He's already done it. When Ramhorn yells his name back at him in frustration, Galavar replies that isn't his name anymore. He has evolved. From now on, he will only answer to his new name, like his namesake, Megatron. He tells the council that like his ancestor Megatron, he will lead the Predacons to glory. And when he meets the council again, they will kneel before him. Ramhorn becomes furious at Megatron's bold power play here, but his fellow council members advise patience that Galavar's rebellion could serve their cause, that he could never play the long game and truly lead the Predacons, that they'll outmaneuver him and be prepared to take advantage of his success or his failure. Meanwhile, aboard the starship Axelon, we see Rhinox delivering a status report to my favorite Transformer of all time, Optimus Primal. Well, I'm just going to address as Primal or Optimus for the rest of this video. Both of them are sparring in the ship's gym. And one thing I felt as I was reading this conversation between Rhinox and Primal is this feels like a young Optimus Primal, which is a nice change up from the Optimus Primal on the show Beast Wars. I might be misremembering, but wasn't he on the show an already established veteran and leader of the Maximals? I really might be misremembering, but let me know in the comments down below. 
What we learn here is despite his promotion to captain, Primal is yearning for some real action and adventure. He feels that their current mission delivering the, these protoform science experiments is boring and starts to wonder what would happen if they used the Axelon's transwarp drive to explore time and space because the universe is full of mystery. However, Rhinox reminds him the transwarp usage is strictly regulated because the dangers of contaminating a time stream are considerable. And Maximal Command hates that type of thing. So this is why Optimus believes Maximal Command deliberately posted him to this mission to get him to fall in line and to learn his place. But Primal says he hates falling in line. Primal and Rhinox get contacted by Ninx on the bridge. She informs them that they're receiving a message from Cybertron. And one thing that's funny here is Rattrap is talking smack behind Optimus's back, saying his highness is coming to the bridge. But he doesn't realize Optimus heard that over the channel that it's still open. And I don't remember if Rattrap had this little beef with Primal on the show, but it's funny. On the ship's bridge, the crew receives word of the Predacon's attack from Ironhide here. And I don't know what it is, but Ironhide's form in this reminds me of X-Men's Nimrod. Ironhide lets them know about the Predacons attacking the Ministry, stealing this artifact that has sensitive information, destroying most of the transwarp capable ships, and stealing a transwarp capable warship. And really the big fear Maximal Command has is the ripple effect the Predacons can cause from directly meddling with the time stream. Optimus quickly deduces that Ironhide is contacting them because Maximal Command has no other options. Ironhide wishes them luck and transmit the Predacon's warship trajectory. Now we learn from Rattrap's discussion with Cheetor here, the reason why the Predacons haven't used the transwarp drive on their ship yet is that since they stole the warship, they don't have the access codes and need time to crack them. That's why they're coming to the back end of the universe. As everyone is at their stations getting ready to encounter the warship Darkseid, one thing I noticed here is that Ninx has the new Maximal Insignia which looked better in my opinion than the original. Also, I should mention this, she's a new character that wasn't on the original Beast Wars show. And this is cool because on the show, you didn't get another female Transformer until Black Arachnia showed up. When the Dark Side ship arrives, Primal orders Nynx to intercept and for Cheetor to fire when he has a clear shot. Rhinox suggests to try talking to them first, but Primal replies he normally would agree with that course of action but with them being so outgunned, he thinks it's better to take out the thrusters to hobble them first. On the dark side, Skull informs Megatron of the Axelon targeting their thrusters, and Megatron orders to activate the countermeasures for Scorponok to destroy them. The Axelon outmaneuvers their attacks, but since the dark side is jamming their targeting sensors, Cheetor can't safely take out the engines, but fires back anyways, hoping to get a lucky shot. As this was all happening, Tarantulus unlocks the transwarp drive. And Megatron sends him the coordinates from the golden disc and when Tarantulus sees the coordinates he mentions how they seem familiar. On the Axelon, Rhinox informs Primal the Predacons are firing up their transwarp drive and Primal replies to lock on their signal but Rhinox says it's a risky maneuver. Without the precise mid-flight adjustments they can be torn apart but Nynx chimes in saying she can make the adjustment. The dark side enters transwarp space and the Axelon gets dragged along with it. And Megatron is actually impressed by the Maximals achieving such a maneuver. Pterosaur here tries firing on the Axelon while they're in transwarp space, but Dinobot stops him saying he'll accidentally destroy both ships in the process. However, then the Predacons come out of the transwarp. Megatron mentions how they have seconds before the Axelon comes out as well and tells Pterosaur to fire as much as he would like. Seconds later, the Axon arrives and is immediately blindsided by the Dark Side. Primal tells Cheetor to fire back, but Cheetor replies that the weapons are being unresponsive. But Ninx comes up with a plan, and her plan is one interesting one. She rams the Axon into the Dark Side, pushing it towards the planet. And as both ships tangle together, falling into this planet's atmosphere, Ninx tells Optimus she can get them untangled, but they're still gonna crash. Rhinox overhearing this says the crash would destroy the protoform pods they carry. With no other choice, he releases them into orbit so they could be safe, with the hope that they'll make it to the surface one day. Both ships crash and both crews end up getting knocked unconscious and severely damaged. The AI of both ships reboot and begin to repair the bots, but is alerted of the toxic levels of the Energon radiation. So they scan for compatible options which are living creatures that reside on the planet and fossilized remains. Once repaired and fully rebooted, the Maximals see their beast modes. 
And Optimus asks the ship's AI why the change was necessary and learns that prolonged exposure to raw energon on this planet will lead to a stasis lock and death without proper protection. At the crash site of the dark side, Tarantulas asks Megatron why they come here of all places. And Megatron explains the Maximals extracted the location of this energon rich planet from the disk before he stole it. Now that that's been proven true, whatever else hidden on the disk must be true as well. That with the raw energon on this planet at their disposal, the Predacons would have enough power to overthrow Maximal Command. But before that can happen, he must take out the crew of the Axelon, thinking they must have survived as well. He says a new war has begun, and this time it's the Predacons who will win. Part 1 ends with the beginning of the Beast Wars. Part 2 opened on the Axelon. Rhinox is looking over all the data on this planet that was obtained from the ship's scanners. And everything about this planet just doesn't make sense to him. You have biomes like the desert and an arctic tundra coexisting side by side. You have mountains floating in the sky and the huge matter of raw energon that resides on this planet. Rhinox gets angry with Ratchap here because he's eating this random fruit, saying bots don't eat organic matter, only energon. However, Rattrap points out that it's much faster to eat the organic matter because their new bodies metabolize it and is a much better option than trying to instead process the local energon into something usable since that takes forever. And as this is going on, they're being watched by the trio of Vok. Now, the Vok are these energy-based alien beings who are behind the creation of this weird prehistoric Earth. They have their designs on this planet and their own experiments. And they were actually a part of the original Beast Wars show. They were these like floating skeleton heads. And there were two of them instead of a trio. At one point on the show, they even posed as Unicron when meeting with Optimus Primal. And they also created one of the most unique looking of the Beast Wars Transformers, Tiger Hawk, who I hope makes an appearance in this series. If any of you guys know more about them, please let me know in the comments down below. They inspect Rhinox memories and discover the Maximals aren't the only ones who arrived on their planet, but the Predacons as well. They teleport into the dark side. And please forgive me if I butcher these names. But Bacock finds both groups intriguing, and Tunra is worried they will contaminate their pristine data that, to make sure it stays that way, suggests eradicating both groups. And the debate comes down to Takani, who believes they're both right and offers a compromise here. That for the time being, they monitor both factions. But if their disruptions prove to be too severe, they will just raise the planet and start all over again. They end up teleporting away. Scorponok goes to see Megatron, who's been trying to decode the secrets hidden within the Golden Disk, but just keeps failing. And Scorponok suggests to him that he could try, and Megatron just grips him by the throat. And Scorponok reminds him that Megatron said that they were going to attack the Maximals, but he's just been focusing on the disk, that his fellow Predacons are growing restless. Megatron then throws him across the room. Now what Megatron says next shows to me he may be just as intelligent as his ancestor. He tells Scorponok they won't attack until they are sure of their defenses, and can't be sure of them until Tarantulas finishes surveying the area. Meanwhile, at the Axelon, Optimus Primal checks in with Nyx as she works on repairing the ship. Nyx says Cheetor and her successfully boosted the ship's scanners to get a better look at the area around them, and Optimus suggests taking a break and testing out her new wings, her new beast mode. Though she's reluctant at first, Prime tells her it's important to know the lay of the land, and he prefers a first-hand reconnaissance. Nyx, happy at the opportunity, transforms into her beast form and flies off. Back at the dark side, we see Dinobot speaking to Tarantulas, trying to find out the progress in mapping the surrounding area since Megatron is too focused on decoding the disk. Now he discovers that Tarantulas has stopped mapping the planet and shifted his focus on these curious readings that Skull came across when she was calibrating some sensors. She mistakenly scanned the ship first and found these unspace readings all over. Skold here, I should mention, is also a new character that like Nynx wasn't a part of the original Beast Wars show. Now I should mention this, Eric Burnham said in a Q&A that's at the end of issue 1 that he has a longer term arc in mind for her and it's one of his favorites, so I'm excited to see her character growth as the series progresses. Tarantulas says to Dinobot that 
Either there was pollution from activating the transwarp drive, or something else may have happened. Either way, wouldn't you want to know what it is? And Dinobot replies no, and orders Tarantulas to shift his priority back to mapping out the planet and continue his research on his own time. Tarantulas snaps at Dinobot, telling him he has no authority over him, and when Dinobot replies he has no respect for the chain of command, Tarantulas reminds him that there is no chain of command, they're all rogue agents who follow Megatron so long as their interests continue to align. Now this is really interesting here. Part 2 is showing us so far that both groups, the Maximals and Predacons, what they have in common is that both aren't really united. The members are not even familiar with each other yet. You have Primal who just recently was given command of the Maximals aboard the Axelon and Megatron who most likely recently formed this group of Predacons here and together just achieved their first mission. Now what I'm gonna say is really more directed towards Megatron. If you guys saw my origin of Megatron videos, which if you haven't, here's a link right here. But the original Megatron built up a reputation as someone who rebelled against the Autobots. He went from being a miner to a survivor of a massacre to a prisoner to then becoming the most powerful undefeated gladiator of Kaon before even forming the Decepticons. So that undying loyalty, that inspiration of you can become more than you are, no matter your station, and fear of what Megatron can do to you, was already there before he even made his power play. And that's what Galavar should have said the new Megatron is really missing when it comes to the Predacons. So it would, won't be really surprising if we find out at some point that some of the members of the Predacons have their own agendas. We go to Nynx as she's taking in the sights of this new world in her beast mode. She tries to contact the Axelon but discovers that she's out of range. And out of nowhere, Pterosaur appears. He chases Nynx as she's trying to escape. And she's able to escape the clutch of his beak like a couple times here. And he then transforms into his bot form. And as he's falling, he just opens fire on Nynx. And one of his many shots eventually hits Nynx and knocks her unconscious. Pterosaur transforms back into his beast mode and catches her body. Later, we see Megatron still failing to decrypt the disc. He gets pissed when he's interrupted again until he sees it's Pterosaur who has brought Inks to him. Part 2 ends with Inks becoming the Predacon's prisoner. Part 3 opens later that night. We go to Inks in the Predacon's torture chamber. Megatron, who's leading the interrogation, tells Inks that she'll answer all of his questions about the Maximals or he'll turn her over to Tarantulas who will have her experience pain she's never felt before. She replies that Tarantulas is a butcher, so it's safe to assume the mad scientist most likely has a reputation on Cybertron where he's known for maybe experimenting and killing other bots. Maybe he has a Dr. Frankenstein mixed with a little bit of a Hannibal Lecter reputation. That would actually be pretty cool and crazy and unique if that was the case. Tarantulas toys with Nynx saying no matter what she will feel pain but how much determines her answers. We see Dinobot doesn't like this course of action. When Tarantulas asks him if he's gonna watch he replies he'll wait outside. And as he's waiting outside he hears the sound of Nynx's screams. Meanwhile on the Axelon Cheetor starts to worry that Nynx still hasn't returned from her scouting mission. And Primal suggests that she was so excited to explore maybe she probably lost track of time. And I'm going to be honest, I think it's dumb or I should say naive that Optimus is just assuming that's the case because they're on a world they know nothing about and that's the point Cheetor makes here. Saying not only that but also there can be any number of threats on this world besides the Predacons. However, Prime doesn't want to risk sending one else out in the unknown, especially after nightfall. He suggests waiting until morning and asks Cheetor to try and establish a link with the protoform pods that are in orbit so they can expand their sensor range to planet wide. And Cheetor reluctantly agrees. Now this conversation we see between Optimus and Rhinox is even more evidence to me that this is a young Optimus Primal who's kind of even also maybe new to command. Rhinox points out that he sounded chipper earlier and has gotten that adventure he craved. They're shipwrecked on an unfamiliar planet with a crew member in need of rescue. Primal asks Rhinox if he thinks he made the right call earlier, and Rhinox replies he was right to hold off until morning, that maybe Nynx got lost and hopefully hunkered down for the night. But if he is going to be honest, he doesn't really know if that's what happened to her. Back on the dark side, the Predacons continue to torture Nynx. Megatron offers her another chance to give up what she knows, that if she doesn't, 
eventually the torturing she's enduring will leave irreversible damage. And this replies, history barely remembers the original Me Megatron, and that no one will remember him either. Megatron gets so angry, and he really loses his cool here. He increases the power of the torture device to the highest setting. Nyx's screams cause Dinobot to enter the room and step between Megatron and the device controls, pointing out that they can't acquire any useful information from a dead prisoner. Megatron is so furious that Dinobot stopped him that he grabs Dinobot by the throat, viewing his actions as insubordination. And Dinobot replies, saying a worthy enemy deserves a respectful death. I love that Dinobot has a warrior code. He's reminding me of like Zoro from One Piece. Tarantulas interrupts their confrontation, telling Megatron he was able to deduce that nobody would withstand all this punishment and still stay silent unless they had comrades to protect. Megatron agrees and rewards Tarantulas by allowing him to use Nynx for his experiments. And Tarantulas is happy about this and ex is excited at the opportunity of trying out a prototype he's been dying to try. Megatron releases Dinobot and says to him he understands the logic behind his little outburst, and since he's a kind and generous leader, he forgives him but to never defy him again. When I first saw this, you guys, I was like, all right, Dinobot's affection to the Maximals is definitely coming soon. Later, Nynx wakes up just outside the dark side, initially thinking she was waking up from a bad dream until she hears Megatron's voice say it was no dream. Nynx tries to transform and fly off but ends up falling and reversing back to her bot form. Her onboard computer warns her that the Energon poisoning is underway, that she must transform to her beast mode. This is when Tarantulas reveals to Nynx that his prototype, the Transformation Lock Lens, which actually originated on the show, is keeping her from transforming to her beast mode. He even reveals to her what he's going to do to her body after she goes dark, which is consume her body parts in an Energon bath. So my guess of his reputation being Frankenstein mixed with Hannibal Lecter seems like it wasn't too far off. Nynx tries to use her weapons in order to destroy the lock lens, but discovers her weapon system has been disconnected. She realizes her only option is to run, and as she tries to run away, the Predacons toy with her by taking shots. When Pterosaur tells Dinobot to get in on the fuck before the Energon poisoning kills her, Dinobot takes a shot, but not at Nynx. He blasts the transformation lock lens into pieces. Megatron orders the Predacons to kill him, but Dinobot proves here he is nobody to mess with. He first takes out Tarantulas, dodges a blast from Scorponok, insults the Predacons by saying blind loyalty is for the simple-minded. He takes out Scorponok by throwing Pterosaur at him, while saying he'll kill any enemy he faces in battle, and he lives to fight. And then he elbows Waspinator in the face. However, Skull gets a clean shot on Dinobot and then transforms into her beast mode. And Dinobot tries to convince Skull that she can change and be better than the rest of the Predacons. And she replies that she doesn't abandon others, that the Predacons never did that to her. But Dinobot replies, of course they didn't. They don't abandon those useful to them. And Skull gets pissed at his words and says to stop talking to her and says that he's nothing but a traitor. Megatron confronts Dinobot, saying that he knew they were going to use guerrilla tactics instead of taking on Maximal Command head on, and he still joined them. That he thought him strong and worthy, but he was wrong. That this was probably bound to happen. All brilliant leaders are tested. And Dinobot's reply here is so good. He lays the verbal smack down on Megatron when he says, if strength is all it took to be a leader, then Scold would be in charge. And as far as brilliant, your plans are half thought out at best. You don't know how to use or inspire your followers. You even lost your maximal hostage. You'll have to start thinking things through. When I read this, I was like, <laughs> Damn. Dinobot just roasted Megatron. He then hurls Scold's body at Megatron, knocking him back into the ship. Dinobot speaks this code that forces the dark side ship into lockdown and ends up trapping all the Predacons inside. Part 3 ends with Megatron admitting that Dinobot's treachery, his execution was flawless, but promises his fellow Predacons that when he gets his hands on Dinobot, they'll witness another flawless execution. Part 4 opens with Nynx after being saved by Dinobot and escaping the Predacons. She's taking shelter inside this tree in the forest. And Nyx realizes she's badly injured, 
she can't contact the Maximals, and when she says her only option is to fly to the Axelon, her onboard computer tells her that's not an option either. And Nyx decides to ignore it because making it into the Axelon and into a cryogenic restoration chamber without flying would take a miracle. When flying fails, despite the computer warning her against it, she decides to take her chances by transforming into her bot form so she can walk home. She doesn't get far, however, before this huge, saber-toothed, spiky-looking tiger comes leaping out of the bushes to attack her. Nyx tries to use her weapons, but finds them still offline. She manages to backroll and kick this predator in its underbelly as it pounces towards her, but it quickly gets on its feet again. She then grabs a branch to use as a club and gives this beast a nice swing to the face. Unfortunately though, this beast is one tough cookie. It shrugs off her blow like it was nothing. The beast destroys her club and it leaps toward Nynx to deliver a killing blow, but is stopped by Dinobot, who literally grabs this predator like it's nothing and then tosses it. And I love Dino. Initially, Nyx warns Dinobot to stay back and says she's not going back to their ship. However, she's surprised when Dinobot replies he has no intention of going back either. And when she finds out he's the one who helped her. Nyx ends up succumbing to her injuries and the Energon poisoning. And Dinobot tries to get Nyx's status from her onboard computer, but the computer refuses to give him a detailed analysis. Dinobot ends up putting Nyx onto his back and he's able to get Nyx's onboard computer to let him access her internal movement logs so he can reach the Axelon. Later at the Axelon, Rhinox and Cheetor are working on the Axelon sensor range by manually rewiring the ship systems. As they work their way through the ship's computer, Cheetor discovers something really suspicious here. Someone aboard their ship logged a message to the Predacon Technolab just before they left Cybertron. Rhinox points out though that the Maximals and Predacons have always shared information because of the Pax Cybertronia mandates it. And if you're not aware what the Pax Cybertronia is, it's the binding peace accord that's responsible for ending the great war between the Autobots and the Decepticons. And Cheetor is like, okay, even though that's the case, if all of if it is above board, then why delete the message? And Ronax assures him that there is no skullduggery as he puts it. But this is kind of crazy that we have a possible spy amongst the Maximals. I'm gonna guess it's probably Rat Trap or Nyx. Those are my guesses. Let me know in the comments down below who do you guys think it is. And if it's already been revealed in the series, please no spoilers if you know already. Rat Trap enters the room, having scavenged this item he's carrying from Nyx's room. And just as he plugs it in and turns it on, a ping from the bridge catches the crew's attention. An Optimus Primal appears, telling them he turned a data collection shell into an improvised radar dish to strengthen their connection to the orbital protoform network which makes it easier for them to cut through the energon interference and after that he programmed it to find nix's personal com frequency i like that eric burnham is showing that optimus is very intelligent and that he's more than just a soldier as they look on the hollow map they see nix's signal and notice it's moving slowly and primal begins to think something may be wrong and gets mad at himself for not going sooner to find Nynx. Meanwhile on the dark side, the Predacons are still locked on the ship, and we see Tarantulus is working on unlocking the ship and is pissed that Dinobot got the upper hand on him, saying he refuses to be outsmarted by a grunt when he's the greatest genius Cybertron has ever seen, which I doubt is true. Eventually Tarantulus unlocks the ship and Megatron orders the Predacons to hunt. He tells them that their primary target is Dinobot, secondary is Nynx. He tells them they don't come back until they've tasted victory and vengeance. He orders Pterosaur and Waspinator to take the sky. He orders Scorponok to follow Dinobot's trail. And when Scorponok says that Dinobot is just as good at covering his trail as he is at following them, Megatron replies, well, you can find excuses, so pretend Dinobot is one of those. I was just like, damn, Megatron is a jerk. He tells Tarantulas and Scold here that they're with him that if Dinobot is foolish enough to be waiting for them, he'll be met with greater numbers. Now, the funny thing here is, is Skold kind of says under her breath that Dinobot fought them all before, which is true, and he beat the brakes off of all of them. I guess Megatron forgot about that. Now, what Megatron does next is kind of crazy here. In order to ensure no one else betrays him, he activates a self-destruct sequence that will activate if anyone goes on board the ship that isn't him. At the Axelon, Optimus and the Maximals are on the lookout for any signs of Nynx. Finally, they catch sight of Dinobot with Nynx on his back. 
Now, Optimus assumes that Dinobot must have kidnapped her, and he leads the Maximals into action. But they pause for a moment when Dinobot introduces himself and explains what happened to Ninx and her current condition. However, Cheatsword doesn't care to hear him out and goes on the attack. But Dinobot, with no problem, grabs Cheatsword by the throat and throws him to the ground. He pulls out Psycarbon Blade, which looks so awesome, and threatens to end Cheetor's life in order to get the Maximals' full attention. Dinobot makes the Maximals aware of the war that's coming and how he wishes to fight alongside those who are honorable. That Ninx proved to be honorable and hopes the other Maximals are as well, but would like to find out. Part 4 ends with Dinobot formally requesting to become a Maximal. Part 5 opens inside the Axelon. Dinobot is being detained in a holding cell, and we see Optimus Primal is interrogating him, trying to find out why he really is here. He doesn't believe Dinobot's change of heart, and suspects him to be a Trojan horse. Dinobot tells Optimus he wishes to fight at the Maximal side, and that's really it. It's really that simple. But then, with a smirk on his face, just casually asks Optimus, would he prefer if he challenged him for command? He even says, we can still battle to your death in front of the others. And Optimus with a smirk on his face as well, asks, what makes you think I wouldn't be the winner? And I really, really like this back and forth between Optimus and Dinobot. But now, here's my question to you guys. One on one. In a knockdown, drag out fight, who wins? Let me know in the comments down below. Before Dinobot can answer Optimus, Ninx enters the room, fully repaired from her injuries. She asks Optimus if she can speak to Dinobot alone, and Optimus allows it, and he starts to say something else but stops himself, and then just exits the room. Now this conversation you guys are about to witness between Dinobot and Ninx is amazing. Dinobot accurately deduces that Optimus is new to command, because Optimus let Ninx go off on her own without fully considering all the possible consequences that maybe he should have challenged Optimus. Ninx tells Dinobot she isn't here to talk about Optimus. She's here to ask Dinobot why did he help her. And when Dinobot replies that it's because she didn't deserve to die being tortured, Ninx replies, why do you care? And makes a really good po point here saying that she knows that there has been peace for a long time between the Maximals and Predacons, but that animosity, that hatred doesn't just go away. It runs deep within the spark. And when Dinobot tries to joke with her, she snaps at him, saying he doesn't get to joke with her because he's a terrorist who attacked the science ministry, the shipyards, the Axelon, and then tortured her. And Dinobot slowly rises to his feet and says to Ninx that he did not torture her. He then asks Ninx a very interesting question here. What does she know about the Predacon? Without any prejudice, hearsay, but what she knows for certain from her own experiences. And that is a very, very good question. I love this because he's basically saying, don't judge me based on other people's opinions or what you've heard. Judge me based on your own experiences with me and my people. And Nick's replies, what she knows for certain is that the Predacons are aggressive and violent. And Dinobot tells her, well, it's because we come from a warrior caste and further explains that they were meant to be warriors. That's who they are. But there's not always a war to fight, so they had to learn to be content and thrive in any conflict they found themselves in, whether it be in athletics or law, that some Predacons even joined the sciences to fight accepted knowledge, and the rest served as peacekeepers. That he believes in honor, and Megatron said he did too, that's how he recruited Dinobot to his cause. And Megatron argued that the Maxwell's attempt to cover up the importance of the Golden Disk was a disgrace. And Dinobot agreed with that and says he still does. But when he saw how the Predacons, especially how Megatron acted, once they got the disk, he didn't like it. And Ninx being tortured was his breaking point. However, he makes it clear that if he and Ninx battled, he would have killed her without hesitation. But instead, he saw someone refusing to give up despite being tortured, and he respected that, and tells her that's the reason why he helped her. We then see Rat Trap here watching the conversation between Dinobot and Ninx from the bridge, and Cheetor catches him doing this. All of a sudden though, Rat Trap notices an alarm going off. Just outside the Axelon, Megatron and the other Predacons have successfully tracked Dinobot and Ninx to the ship. 
when Pterosaur suggests to Megatron the idea to attack the Axelon from a distance, this is where we see even more arrogance from Megatron. He's kind of being overconfident. He ignores Pterosaur's suggestion because he thinks that the outnumbered Maximals and the ship being heavily damaged will be no match for them. On the Axelon, the Maximals watch as the Predacons are closing in. And Optimus orders Rat Trap to raise his defenses, but Rat Trap gives him some bad news that all the time they spent searching for Ninx distracted them from running repairs. Optimus, with not much of a choice, orders Rat Trap to do what he can to get the defenses up while he, Cheetor, and Rhinox buy him time. As the Maximals are approaching the Predacons, Megatron is able to deduce that they have no force shields to hide behind. He orders Tarantulas to sneak into the ship and to find a way to destroy it from within. Megatron really, his cockiness and arrogance knows no bounds. He introduces himself to the Maximals as the future ruler of Cybertron and gives them an ultimatum. Lay down and swear an oath of loyalty or face destruction. Optimus counters back by introducing himself and offering them an opportunity to surrender. Megatron says he'll live to regret being defiant and orders the Predacons to terrorize. Inside the Axelon, Nynx and Dinobot hear the sounds of the battle outside, and Nynx asks the ship's computer what's going on, and the computer reports that the Axelon is under Predacon attack. And Dinobot asks Nynx to release him, and she's hesitant at first, even though he saved her life. But Dinobot points out that the Maximals are outnumbered, and will be overtaken without his help. We go to the battle outside, and we see Cheetor going up against Scorponok and Waspinator. And he's kind of pulling a flash here, which is pretty cool. He's moving so fast that they both can't get a hit on him. We see Rattrap working on repairing the ship's systems, and while he's doing that, he hears an unusual noise. And when he goes to investigate, he discovers Tarantulas. And as Tarantulas has his fangs closing in on Rattrap, he says maybe he'll have a snack before destroying the ship. However, Rattrap manages to grab his arc welder and torches Tarantulas in the face, which gives him the opportunity to run away. Tarantulas transforms into his bot form, shouting at Rattrap, saying he'll deal with him after he's done with the ship. Outside, as the battle rages on, we finally get what we've been waiting for. Optimus Primal versus Megatron. Though Megatron knocks down Optimus and gets the upper hand in this fight, Optimus says to Megatron, I told a friend I don't like falling, but in this case, it gives me an advantage, and sweeps Megatron's legs. We see Cheetor now dodging attacks from Waspinator and Parasaur. And I have to say, Cheetor's speed is really impressive here. He asks for help, but Optimus is fighting Megatron, and Rhinox is battling Scold. I love this fight here, because Rhinox finds Scold just as strong as he is, and yes, she may be tiny, but she's powerful. She gives Rhinox a sure you can to the jaw. We then go back to Megatron and Optimus's battle, and Megatron gains the upper hand again and tries to deliver a killing blow. However, all of a sudden, a laser blast from a distance hits him, and it's from Dinobot. Part 5 ends with Dinobot appearing on the battlefield alongside Nynx. So now we are at the finale of Savage Landing. If you've made it this far, I greatly appreciate you and I hope you're enjoying this video. Part 6 opens with Rattrap hiding from Tarantulas as he searches for him. And Tarantulas is goading Rattrap here, trying to get him to come out of hiding by saying he's gonna destroy the ship if he doesn't stop him, that the Maximals will die if he doesn't stop him. Luckily, Rattrap is too smart to fall for it. Tarantulas ends up giving up when he realizes Rattrap isn't falling for it. As he's walking through the corridors, his attention is taken by the Maximals tech lab and pries it open to enter so he can see what he can plunder. The mad scientist's temptation gets the best of him despite his mission. Meanwhile, outside, as the Maximals and Predacons battle, we see Dinobot beating the brakes off a of Waspinator here. He literally tears his arm off and beats him with it. Like how you get beat with your own arm, bro? As this battle is going on, Pterosaur watching from above, is hoping since Dinobot joined the battle, the Maximals will gain the upper hand and Megatron will be hobbled or destroyed in the process, making it easier for him to take over the Predacons. But Pterosaur gets a taste of his own medicine when Nynx appears and takes him by surprise and tells Pterosaur we have a score to settle, which this was so awesome. Back on the ship, Tarantulas hacks into the Maximal computer and accesses the flight log. 
where he discovers the cargo of protoform pods the Axelon was forced to eject are now in orbit around the planet. And this is where we learn yet another member of the Predacons has their own secret machinations. Tarantula says to himself if he can bring down the pods from orbit down to the surface, he can raise his own army. And Megatron would end up bowing to him. Rattrap, who is watching Tarantulas from the ship's air duct systems, overhears his plan. He says to himself, though he isn't a fighter, there is something he can find that'll stop Tarantulas. Back at the battle, we see Megatron gloating yet again as he is crushing Optimus. Megatron says that if he surrenders now and dies with dignity, he'll memorialize him in the historical records. However, Primal replies with what I was thinking. You talk too much and smashes himself out of Megatron's grip. Megatron ends up charging his cannon and decides that he'll still allow Optimus Primal's name to grace the historical records of his new empire. But as he prepares to fire, Ninx throws Pterosaur into Megatron's blast. As that's going on, Tarantulas is struggling with the maximal security system. Rattrap, pulling a Ripley from Aliens, is inside a ship's cargo loading exoskeleton, catching Tarantulas by surprise. Like this was so awesome. He ends up tossing him right out the window. This whole scene definitely had to be inspired by Aliens. Anyways, now with Tarantulas gone, Rattrap is now able to finish repairing the ship's defensive force fields. He tells the ship's onboard AI after he's done to boot up the force fields to their maximum range. As the force fields are activated, the Maximals fall back towards the ship, and Ninx tells Dinobot to fall back with them as the force fields are specifically tied to the source code of the Maximals to prevent the Predacons and their weapons from getting through. Unfortunately though, Nynx forgot Dinobot is a Predacon, so he ends up not being able to go through and is left on the outside as the Predacons encircle him. And Dinobot is confident, which I love, because he says he's taken them all alone before. However, Megatron points out that he was lucky because he had the element of surprise on his side. I love Dinobot's response to that. He says that there are only five of you, I'll make this quick. And what Megatron says you should count again out of nowhere, Tarantulas appears from behind and stabs Dinobot through the chest. When I first saw this, I was like, no! Dinobot drops to the ground and the Predacons start to lay a beat down on him. Nynx shouts that they have to do something and Primal agrees and contacts the Axelon to engage the dual plasma cannons. They end up firing the volley of blasts at the Predacons and Primal tells Megatron to leave before he fires again. And Megatron does so, but not before kicking Dinobot one last time. And as the Predacons retreat, Megatron warns Optimus that he was a fool for not pushing the advantage when he had it. That one day he will pay for that mistake with his life. That Megatron will be victorious. The story then takes us a few days later, we get an epilogue here. Kind of finishing our story with the Maximals the way it started. Optimus and Rhinox holding another sparring match in the gym. And through their conversation, we learn that Megatron's parting words are weighing heavily in Optimus's mind, and it's made him think about his actions as a leader since they landed. That the possibility of the action and adventure he was yearning for clouded his judgment, and nearly got Nynx killed, and him not wanting to trust Dinobot nearly cost them the battle. I love this right here because we're seeing Optimus grow, we're seeing him learn from his mistakes. Rhinox reminds him that nobody's perfect and to not second guess himself, especially now with the stakes so high. As they're leaving the gym, Rhinox asked Optimus how's Dinobot doing. Optimus replies he doesn't know, that the damage he sustained was extensive and the ship's restoration chamber can only do so much and he even wonders if his spark will fade. But Dinobot answers his question when he enters the room using a walking stick. He tells Optimus he'll live, but his injuries were severe, and he doesn't know if he'll ever be the same warrior he was. That he's come to say goodbye, he's put going into exile, because he believes he won't be an asset to the Maximals. But Optimus stops him and asks him to reconsider. And this is where we get a little bit of history when Optimus reminds Dinobot of the significance of his name and tells him the history of the Dinobots. That they were a great faction of Autobots during the Great War who were savage but courageous and fought bravely until their untimely disappearance. 
that he sees those same qualities in Dinobot, and he then asks Dinobot to reconsider and would be honored if he joined the Maximals. And though Dinobot is hesitant at first, he eventually accepts the offer. The finale ends with Dinobot officially a part of the Maximals. And that is the end of Transformers Beast Wars, the Savage Landing art. This story was so good. I think Eric Burnham did a very good job. And I'm not gonna lie, it took me some time to get used to the art style. Initially, I didn't like it, but then it grew on me. Josh Burkham did a very good job as well. This story had such a great blend of both being familiar to fans of the original show and surprising us with new things. Well, if you made it to the end of this video, I greatly appreciate you. This was definitely the hardest video I've ever done, the longest video I've ever done, and I'm honestly am nervous about how it's going to be received. So for my next video though, I need everyone's opinion on this. I have three videos to do that are laid out in front of me. I have the full story of Wreckers, Tread and Circuits that I can do, and that will be another long video. Or I have the spotlight of Orion, Pax, and Blur that I can do. Or I can do the next six issues of Beast Wars and be caught up now with where the series is at. So those are the three videos I have in mind. You guys let me know in the comments down below which do you guys want to see next. I hope every one of you enjoyed this video. So if you did, please subscribe to the channel. Comment down below what you think should be the next video and what you think of this story. And lastly, hit that like button. I would greatly appreciate that as well. Other than that, peace, love, and blessings to you and your families. Have an awesome day. And always remember every day to go beyond us ultra. See you later, Beyonders.